everyone. We're just about ready to start. We are now going to be um, talking with Hal Getzelman, who is a lead Capcom for NASA and also a native of Elgin. He graduated from Elgin High School, and he's live from the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. So, Hal, are you there? Hi, Hal. Yes, I am. How are you? Hi, Hal. It's Carol Metal, and we are going to start with there were four of our students. Uh, we, uh, the, the, the International Space Station just got out of our range and they could not ask their questions to, uh, to Jeff. So we're gonna start off with them, if that's okay with you, Hal. That's great, I'm ready to go. Okay, come on forward here. Who are your heroes in the space program? Well, um, I have two big heroes. They're both named John. The first one is John Glenn, and uh, he was one of the original seven Mercury astronauts. And uh, while I was working down here uh, uh, several years back, he came down and he trained and flew on the space shuttle. So that was uh, a great opportunity to see him and watch him train and work and then go fly in space. And then the other one, is, uh, as you see, uh, John Young, and John Young was part of the second group of astronauts. He flew on the Gemini, the Apollo program. Hal, uh, we're, we're losing sound. Houston, we do have a problem. <laughs> Hello? We can hear you. Yeah, okay. We can't see you yet. All right. Well, give us a second. Please don't make us choose. <laughs> there we go. There he is. How can you? Or... I can hear you, but I just can't see you yet. Okay, now we can see you. Can you see me? We yes. can see you and hear you. Okay. <laughs> awesome. All right. Do uh, uh, what, the question you were answering. Okay. Yeah, I talked about John Glenn and John Young. Where where did I drop out? Uh, I think you were just tar starting to talk about John Young. Okay, so John Young was part of the second group of astronauts, the second seven, and he was able to fly on the first Mercury or the first Gemini mission, and then he flew on the Apollo mission. Eventually, he landed on the moon, and he holds the the extraterrestrial driving record in the moon buggy and uh, he also was the commander for the first shuttle mission so he's quite an illustrious uh, hero uh, in the astronaut corps what has nasa found out about the dwarf planet series well um you probably heard and saw on the internet that there is a uh satellite called uh, Dawn that is circling Ceres right now. And uh, Ceres is a, uh, an asteroid in the main asteroid belt. It's about 590 uh, miles in diameter, so about the size of half of Texas. And it uh, has a very mottled surface, sort of like the moon with lots of pot marks. And uh, it has some unusual white markings on it that we think are maybe salt or some other volcanic activity or whatever. We'll have to wait and see what the scientists come up after they look at all the data and do all their research from the information that's coming down. Hi, this is, wait, hi, this is Katessa. How do you prepare in case you have to communicate to your astronauts in an emergency? Well, we do a lot of preparation and mission control. You can see a picture in the background there of mission control. Uh, we, I was fortunate that I was able to help write some of the emergency procedures, and we have simulators where we practice the procedures. Of course, as Capcoms, we get to train on these procedures just like the astronauts do, so we understand what they would have to do in an emergency. And then we have multiple different communication systems that bounce off satellites or go direct to the spacecraft. And then we help coach 
and coordinate the activities on the ground with the activities up in orbit. And hopefully we can come to a quick resolution. I know Jeff talked about uh, a fire down in the Russian segment. Hopefully we can resolve these things fairly quickly before they become dangerous for the crew. Hello, this is Jack. How do you help the astronauts on board the International Space Station? Well, that's a great question, Jack, for a Capcom. I am uh, able to communicate directly for the, the team on the ground. And so what we're trying to do is coordinate the activities of the ground with the activities on orbit. The crew has a timeline that's laid out graphically and each day they look at what they're doing and I help, help them do that. Hi, this is Jeremy. Um, here's a question from the Waukegan Public Library in Illinois. Nicole wants to know, how far is Mars from Earth? Well, it depends. Um, Mars is kind of like uh, running on the track at the, at the high school or junior high. Sometimes Mars is close as the Earth passes by. It's only about 35 million miles away. Other times when Mars is on the other side of the track, on the far side of the track, it's actually 250 million miles away. Now to give you a comparison, the moon is 238,000 miles away. So Mars is about 150 times farther away than the moon at its closest approach. And so you can see how, what a challenge it is that uh, if it takes us three days to get to the moon, going as fast as we can, we're gonna have to even go faster to get to Mars and do it in under a year. So it's a long way to Mars. Hi, this is Luca. Which planet do you think is the most interesting and why? Well, I think, of course, Mars has got everybody's attention because it's a place where we could actually live. But uh, I've got one that's a moon around Saturn called Europa. And uh, what we know about Europa looks like it's a water planet that's covered in ice. And underneath the ice, there may actually be liquid water. And we know that any place you find water, there's a possibility of life. And so that's a very interesting celestial object that I'm really interested in. Are we going to be able to uh, find a way to get under the ice or find any life on that moon uh, around Jupiter? Thank you. Hi, this is Mel. When do you think astronauts will land on Mars? Well, that's a good question. Um, it takes two things to get to Mars. It takes a plan, and it takes determination, and it takes money. Right now we have a plan, and the plan shows us getting to Mars in the mid-2030s. I used to joke that when I was younger, I thought I'd be the perfect age to go to Mars. And now I'm thinking my daughter is maybe too old to get to Mars, but we'll see. I think it's going to take about 10 to 15 years after we get a definitive plan and the dedication and money to go do it after that happens. We'll see, maybe about 2030. Hi, this is Ian. What is NASA working on now to improve space flight? Well, we're working on a lot of things. Um, one of the things that you saw on the um, with Jeff is he's doing a lot of medical experiments. How we keep people healthy for six months on the space station. You may have heard of Scott Kelly uh, and Nikhil. Uh, they were both up on space station for a year, and Mark. Hal and Heather, we're not hearing. You're, you're choppy a little bit, Heather. Well, maybe we're losing a little something with all the visuals. So uh, how do you hear me now? I'm hearing you now. Okay. 
Maybe we'll try to decrease the number of fast switches on our videos there. So we're also working on a new heavy lift booster and uh, that heavy lift booster will give us the capability to put big payloads into space. Um, we're also working on science and technology. We're trying to figure out how to do things cheaper and more cost effective because we want to get this affordable so people are willing to spend money to, to help us go further in space. Thanks. Hello, this is Morgan. Here's a question from the African American Research Library and Cultural Center of Broward County Library in Florida. Lisa wants to know, what is the weirdest thing that happens to your body when you're out in space? Well, that's a great question. We have a lot of doctors that study this problem. And uh, the one thing I think that's interesting is a thing called fluid shift. And fluid shift, normally the fluids in our body want to pool down in our legs. And as we walk or exercise, our muscles squeeze those fluids back up into our heads and arms. But in zero G, there's nothing to pull the fluid down to our toes. So it just kind of floats up towards our head. And for the first three or four days that the astronauts are on board, they tend to look like uh, their face is all puffy and they kind of look like the marshmallow man from uh, Ghostbusters, if you ever saw that movie. So, after a while, the, the fluid kind of leaves their body and we go. Hi, this is Nathan. What advice would you give a kid who wants to work for NASA someday? Well, you know, there's a lot of things that people are good at or they're interested in, and I would just say find something that really excites you, really interests you, and then go be the best and work the hardest at that. Obviously, you know, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, that's something that we use all the time here at NASA. Uh, but we also have uh, public affairs and media folks and social media. So there's a lot of things you can do for NASA, but you need to give it your best shot and become the best that you can at what really interests and excites you. Hi, this is Tara. When will people who are not astronauts be able to take a, a space flight? Well, um, you may be surprised to know, but they can go now. That is, if you're super rich or a politician, uh, you can go to space today. Uh, we, have, uh, we have seven people have traveled to the space station and they paid the Russians anywhere from 20 to $30 million for the trip. Now, two companies in America, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origins, are going to take people on a suborbital trip just straight up and straight down out of the atmosphere up into space. And then you only have to be fairly rich, uh, about $250,000 for a trip. So. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot more people in space. Hi, this is Brandon. Do you think there is a planet like Earth out in the universe? Well, there was a, an astronomer, a fairly famous one called Carl Sagan. And he used to talk about the billions and billions of stars out there. And with a recent uh, telescope named Kepler, we've been able to determine that most of those stars have planets going around them. And some of those planets live in what's called the Goldilocks zone, where it's not too hot and it's not too cold. So we think that uh, there's a possibility of having many Earth-like planets out there. So very good question, but it looks like it's highly probable that there are some planets around some of the stars we see in the night sky that are Earth-like. Hi, this is Mia. This question is from the Arizona at Wa the Waukegan Public Library. How many cameras does a space station have? Well, 
that's a great question because I didn't know that one off the top of my head and I asked a few people and the best we can guess is something over a hundred cameras and this includes still cameras and video cameras we have many different types of cameras we have what you saw Jeff using which was a high definition camera we have some ultra high definition cameras uh, camcorders on board inside each module there's a camera a video camera the crew uses still cameras for uh, earth observation with long telephoto lens almost uh, two feet long that they take pictures of the earth we have cameras on the outside of the vehicle that we can monitor what the, the solar arrays are doing uh, we have cameras on our uh, remote arm that as we move the arm around we can see where we're moving the arm so we've got a lot of cameras on board um, used for different things. We have cameras on our payloads as well, so they can monitor the progress of the payloads. So I would say over 100. But more important, your question brings up a very important thing, and that is how do we keep track of all that stuff up there? And we have a computer database, and we have people that work full time just keeping track of all the stuff we have packed up and the spare parts and where they are and how we go find them if something broke. But very good question, thank you. Hi, this is Reina. What is your favorite part about working with astronauts? Well, my favorite part about my job is that it makes it difference. And by that I mean uh, a lot of times you're in jobs where you sit in meetings and sometimes something will come from that meeting or a discussion or a paper fight. But when I sit in Mission Control and I talk to the astronauts and I get to help them through the day, uh, I really feel like I'm making a contribution. So that's the most fun. Hi, this is Salome. What has the Hub Hubble telescope found lately? Well, I looked online and there's a, a big Hubble um, telescope website out there. And so what I found was there is, uh, they were looking at some Magellan clouds and they found some star clusters in there. And also they found a galaxy that looks like a shooting star moving rapidly through the universe. So uh, lots of amazing pictures out there, uh, lots of things that Hubble. And one of the more interesting things is NASA has asked the government for five more years of money so we can keep using Hubble for another five years. So I'm sure it's going to discover even more things in the next five years. Hi, this is Gabe. Will NASA figure out how to stop an asteroid from hitting the Earth? Well, that's a, that's a real big challenge. And like most engineering challenges, we can divide that into smaller parts and attack those in different ways. Uh, one thing we have to do is we have to detect this asteroid coming our way. And then, two, we have to predict whether it's going to hit the Earth or miss. There's no use trying to worry about something that's going to miss. And then finally, we have to figure out how to divert it or destroy it. And of course, in the movies, that's where they focus all the effort is on the uh, divert and destroy. Makes a really good movie. But uh, right now, we're putting some additional satellites in orbit. We're using a lot of ground resources. So we're cataloging a lot more of this near-Earth objects so hopefully we can find anything big enough to do some serious damage and categorize whether it's going to be a threat or not. And then we can go out there and move it out of the way so it doesn't uh, rendezvous with us sometime in the future. So I think eventually we'll be able to do that. Hopefully we have enough time before that happens. Well, Hal, uh, where we've got, I, we've through our time period, we are so extremely grateful for all of you, what you have done for the kids in Elgin. Um, we know how much you've made possible by being there and being here for this community, uh, for these kids. Uh, we know how beneficial it is 
that we have a Hal Getzelman who graduated from Elgin High School in uh, working for NASA and making a lot of things possible for us. Uh, we want to thank you, thank you, thank you. And we're going to sign off here. So, kids, what do we have to say to Hal? Bye.